16. Romans 1, 16. And um, this morning we're going to do something a little different. Rather than just me reading, it's, it's a fairly short portion. We're only going to look at two verses this morning. I'd like you all to read along out loud with me. So if you're able this morning, we stand for the reading of God's Word. If you're using your Pew Bible, it's going to be on page 796, page 796. Altogether, reading loud and loudly. I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This is God's word. You may be seated. I should have clarified we're all reading the NIV. (laughs) You're you're welcome. So, (laughs) Now, now some of you are here this morning and you're saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, Pastor Robert. Um, What's going on? Because you were here last Sunday and you saw that we got through eight verses and now we're just looking at two verses. And you're saying, well, if, if we do two verses a Sunday, it's going to take us not just a year, but it's going to take us a decade to get through the book of Romans. Well, we're not, I'm, I'm putting on the brakes and slowing things down for these verses 16 and 17. And I'll tell you why. Because every commentator I read, and from what I understand, most of the commentators that I didn't read, understand verses 16 and 17 to be the thesis statement for all the entire book of Romans. They, they, they would say this is the key verse. This is, this is the verse from which the rest of the whole book of Romans is going to flow. These two verses, verses 16 and 17. These are, if you would, uh, in, in an arch, the capstone that holds it together. So I, I wanted to put on the brakes to make sure that there's nothing in here that we miss or, or don't get because I, I, I think it'll, if we do, it'll be like, ha, have any of you laid tile before? Okay, some, some of you, okay, wow, I'm the only guy who's laid tile. Come on, Sean, you've laid tile, right? Okay, if, if you lay, some of you ladies have too. If, if you lay tile, the first one you lay is the most important one, because if you're off by like a 32nd of an inch, and it's a big room, you're going to be way off at the end, right? And so uh, this could be, if you would, that corner tile for the book of Romans, so it's important that we, we understand it. So verses 16 and 17, Paul starts off, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What, what, what is this gospel that he's not ashamed? We, we know that the gospel means good news, but, but we use the word gospel differently in, in different contexts in our culture. So uh, yesterday I was at a Mark Cohen concert and he was playing Walking, on Men- um, Walking in Memphis. And, and there's a line in there that talks about there's gospel in the streets. He, he's not talking about that there are preachers going around preaching the gospel in the street. No, he's talking about gospel music. The gospel that Paul is referring to isn't gospel music. He's talking about the good news. What's that good news? Well, he lays it out for us in verses 1 through 4. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus called to be uh, an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in his holy scripture regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul's already told and reminded the, the church in Rome what this gospel is. And the gospel, the good news is that Jesus came. The the long-expected Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the hopes and fears of all the years has, has finally come. Man's fallen state and brokenness. God, God has sent Christ to, to come as a man to undo that fallen state, to, 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 to make the sad things come untrue, if you would. He's, he's come to rescue and redeem. Where mankind messed things up, God, Jesus comes as the second Adam to restore things and make things new. And, and so he comes to show his power and to bring salvation. 
and he shows his power in conquering death, the great enemy, the great enemy that we all face. We, we don't like to talk about death here in America. We don't like to talk about it at all. We, we, we go through surgeries to keep looking younger and younger as if age doesn't have a toll on us. We, we, we bury our dead where we can't see them on the side of the freeway with tall hedges. So we're not reminded of what we know to be true, that, that death is an enemy we will all face. But Jesus, in coming to conquer death, gives us hope. Gives us hope beyond the grave. Jesus, in his life, death, and resurrection, had said, has said, death will not win. Death is not a period Death is but a comma. And so, when when we hear of our brothers and sisters who, who are beheaded off the coast of Libya, we we remind ourselves of this good news. And know that death is not their end. When, when we get a phone call from a loved one who has stage four cancer we re- and, and, and it looks like they're going to die, we remind ourselves of this good no- news and we know that death is not the end for them. When, when we have a miscarriage, we remind ourselves of the gospel and we know that death is not the end. When we bury our parents, we remind ourselves of the gospel and, and we remind ourselves that death is not the end. When we ourselves are dying and perishing and our health is frail, We remind ourselves of the gospel and we know that death is not the end because Jesus has conquered death and in doing so, he has offered us hope and he's given us salvation, not just for after death, but he's given us salvation that we can begin to enjoy now. More on that in a minute. But why does Paul say he is not ashamed of this gospel? Why why does he need to say he's not ashamed of it? Well, well, because because the gospel causes offense, doesn't it? When it's properly preached, this good news of what Christ has done for us is, is somewhat offensive because in its essence, it tells us we are needy and in need of a Savior. John Piper has said, faith is not the boasting of the strong, It's the cry of the weak in need of a Savior. Because the gospel wounds our pride and shows us our brokenness. The the, the story of the gospel tells us that what, what we needed was not just some good advice or some more rules to follow. We didn't need a pick me up. We were in such a sad state that the only thing that could get us out of this sad state was for God Himself to rescue us. What we who were dead in our trespasses and sins needed was to be made alive in Christ. And that's humbling because the gospel shows us our own inadequacy and our own neediness. But the reason, Paul says, he is not ashamed of the gospel is because he says, it, the gospel, look at verse 16, is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Some of your versions might say it's the power of God unto salvation. Listen to what, um, listen to what Tim Keller writes. He says this. The message of the gospel is what God has done and will do for us. God says that the gospel is therefore a power. He doesn't say it brings us It brings or has power, but that it actually is power. The gospel message is actually the power of God in verbal cognitive form. It lifts people up. It transforms and changes things. When it's outlined and explained and reflected on, its power is released. Theodoret, a a Syrian bishop in the 5th century, likened the gospel to a pepper. A peppercorn outwardly seems to be cold. But the person who crunches it between his teeth experiences the sensation of burning fire. In the same way, he goes on, 
The gospel can appear at first to be an interesting theory or philosophy, but when we take it personally, we find it full of power. I, I, um, we, in our family, one of our favorite restaurants to go to is Miguel's down in, um, in Rancho Santa Margarita. And, and occasionally, uh, in some of our dishes, they include peppers. And it, it's always kind of a, is this, is this going to be like a, a pepper that just adds a little spice? Or is it going to be a pepper? You know what I'm talking about? The, the, the gospel is that kind of pepper. It's, it's the power of God unto salvation. The Greek word here is dunamis which is where we get the word dynamite for. So that Paul's saying, this is powerful. This is powerful stuff. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Now, when we talk about salvation, I, I, my hope is this morning that, that your idea of salvation can be expanded a little bit because most of the time when we talk about salvation, we're talking about the not yet aspect of salvation. The, the idea that well, when you die, you're, you're going to go to heaven and be with Jesus. When Christ returns, you're going to be resurrected from the dead. And, and that's a huge, important part of the, the salvation that we enjoy. But our salvation isn't, isn't something that just kind of gets tabled until the afterlife. Our, our salvation is something we experience now. It's, it's both now and not yet. So, so the not yet aspect is heaven, resurrection, but the now aspect of, of, resurrection, of, of your salvation is this. Look, you are now, the Bible says, the Bible use, uses different terms for this, but it's essentially the same thing. The, the Bible says you're born again. The Bible says you're united to Christ by faith. The, the Bible says you're, you're drinking from the well of living water. And in this new relationship, this new covenant that you've entered into with Christ, because of that, you're a child of God. You're, you're a child of God now. You're, you're being a child of God isn't something that just takes place now for you when you die. No, it's something you begin to live experientially now. And, and so you look to God differently. God's not an enemy. You, you have a heavenly father who you know is looking down on you, working all things for his glory and your good. And, and so there are these wonderful benefits of salvation that you enjoy now. You, you have peace with God. You have, you have a clear conscience. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. You've, you've been given a new heart. You have a billion brothers and sisters across the face of the planet who are also trusting in Christ. But that's part of the benefits of the salvation that you're enjoying now. So, so, so when you talk about people needing to get saved, don't, don't just think of the idea of them getting plucked from the fires of hell. Believe me, that's, that's a good thing and that's a big part of it. But it's much more comprehensive. Listen, listen to what James Dunn, who wrote, okay, um, this is a 400-page commentary on the first eight chapters of Romans. Okay, this is like the, the definitive commentary on the book of Romans. It's, it's very, it's got a lot of Greek. It's really technical, but, but there's this, and I hardly ever quote from it, but there's this one quote in here that just, when I was reading it uh, in preparation for this morning's message, I'm like, yes. So, so the, let me share it with you. It's just a couple lines. Paul does not see the gospel as something which merely begins someone on the way to salvation. He sees the gospel, rather, as something which embraces the totality of the process toward and into salvation. So the gospel is not merely an initial proclamation of Christ which wins converts, but it is the whole Christian message and claim in terms of the rest of the letter, not just chapters 1 through 5 or 1 through 8 or 1 through 11, but the whole letter. And, and in fact, some people have called the book of Romans the gospel according to Paul. Because what he lays out for us throughout this entire book is, is the benefits of what it means to be a child of God and what Christ has done, God has done for us in Christ and how we live in the light of that. So, so the gospel is more than just news that we hear once and believe and go on our merry way. The gospel is what sustains us in the Christian life. So, so, so we come to God 
by trusting in Christ's life and death and resurrection, but we continue in relationship with God by, contr- by trusting in that same news ongoingly. We, we, we don't just hear the gospel once and say, hey, I'm good, I believe that. It's, it's, it's not like, well, some of you have done this more. I, I've only taken the driver's test once, okay? I, I, I may eventually have to do it again because of my vision and things like that. But, but I, I, I do that and, and then I drive and, and, and it's, it's something that's marked off like a check mark in, in, in my life. I've, I've got my driver's license. Yay, mission accomplished. Don't think of becoming a child of God like that, 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 that it's something you do and then just put in your back pocket. Think of your relationship with Christ more like this. Um, I may have told this story before, but, but you've, you've heard the story of the old married couple. They, 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 they got married. They actually weren't married that long. They were only married for two years. And, and the wife looked at her husband and he said, she said, sweetheart, you never tell me you love me. To which the husband replied, he says, well, we got married and I told you on the day we got married that I loved you and if anything changes, I'll let you know. You know that, that, that's not how a, a marriage is meant to be cultivated. That's not how our, our relationship with Christ is, is cultivated. It's, there, there's, 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 there's a dependence on Christ that's ongoing. God's more than just a get-out-of-hell-free ticket. So, so how, how does the gospel sustain us on, on an everyday basis? Okay, so, so imagine yourself, you were an unbeliever, you, you come to Christ, and, and now you, you've been forgiven, you have new life with Christ. That, that event is going to change how you live. Part of salvation is now living as a child of God. So, so you're saved, you're a Christian, and then you, you sin. So, some of you remember this. Some of you remember coming to Christ and being shocked when you fell into sin after coming to Christ. You're like, wait! I thought I was done with that! That life was over! Maybe I'm not really saved. Well, no, you're, you're a saint you're a child of God, but you're still struggling with, with sin. Sin is still seeking to entangle you. So, so, so what do you do? Well, you repent and believe the gospel. You, you turn from your sin and trust Christ. You, you, say, you say, God, uh, uh, believing you is a constant re- and reorienting my life towards you, and I'm going to continue to trust you and continue to hate sin and fight sin and battle sin. Uh, um, imagine you've, you've come to Christ and somebody does you wrong and, and, and your initial reaction is, I want to get them back. And something in your spirit says, I don't think that's what you should do as a Christian. And how are you going to know what to do? Well, you preach the gospel to yourself again. You, 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 you realize that you, to whom much has been given, much is required, and you've been forgiven much. And so rather than taking vengeance and seeking how you can settle the score and inflict pain on someone else, you, you seek to reconcile. Because God reconciled you to himself. So the gospel sustains you in that. Friends, the gospel is not just for unbelievers, it's for believers. And we need to keep preaching and keep believing, the, preaching the gospel to ourselves and keep believing it because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. Hmm. There, there, there are many people who talk about how exclusive Christianity is. And it is. The, the, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. But it's also wonderfully inclusive because anybody who believes can be a Christian. It doesn't matter their age. It doesn't matter their ethnic background. It doesn't matter their gender. It doesn't matter their their, their wealth. It doesn't matter their, their level of intellect. It doesn't matter. Salvation is available for all who believe. 
Now, I, I know this is, raises a question, and, and this is probably a sermon in itself, but, but some of you might say, well, what about those who can't believe? What, what, about, what about those who have special needs and aren't able to comprehend the gospel? What about infants? Uh, the, the Bible doesn't tell us everything we want to know. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, the Bible doesn't tell us everything we want to know. The Bible doesn't tell us everything we want to know. I want to know if Adam had a belly button. Nothing about that in the Bible, right? There, there's all kinds of questions we have. Where did the snake come from? I mean, we, we can go on. The Bible doesn't tell us everything we want to know, but what the Bible does tell us is it tells us about the character of God. And so when we face questions that aren't clear to us, we're, we're, reminded, of, we're reminded of the passage back in Genesis that, that tells us, will not the judge of the earth do what is right? So, so, so why, while we might sit here and try to figure out the, the, the very specific, whether they be exceptions or, or, or things that the Bible doesn't tell us about that we're really worried about, can't we see in the Bible what God's character is like? Can't we see his mercy and his grace? Can't we see how he's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love? But, but let's get back to you here this morning who, who do believe or who can believe. Your response this morning, maybe you're here this morning and, and you might be visiting and you might say, well, I, I, I'm a believer. I, I believe in God. Let me share with you the words of R.C. Sproul. He said, it's not a big deal to believe in God. Anyone can do that. What it means to be a Christian is to believe God. Let me repeat that one more time. It's not a big deal to believe in God. Anyone can do that. What it means to be a Christian is to believe God. Friends, do, do you see the difference? Regardless, I, I know atheists get a lot of pub, but the reality is if you look at the amount of people on the face of the planet, the vast majority of people believe that there is a God. They might understand that God differently. He might have different names, things like that. They, they might believe in multiple gods or one God who rules other gods. There's all kinds of different ideas about that. But look, the God who's revealed himself in the Bible isn't concerned that people forget him. He, he's, he's, not, he's not just, oh, I really hope that people don't forget who I am and that they still believe in me. God, God didn't call us to go and make disciples, uh, to make deists, people who believe in a God. He called us to go and make disciples. God wants followers, not just people who believe he exists. He wants people who trust him, who lean on him, who depend on him. That's what being a person of faith in Christ means. God calls us not just to believe in his existence. He calls us to believe him to trust him, to follow him, to rest in him. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And then he says in verse 17, look there with me, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So th this word, in this, this word righteousness or righteous occurs three times in this one verse. I, I, I want to take a moment to make sure we, we understand what it means. Now, we hardly use the word righteous in our vocabulary anymore in our common day vernacular. Uh, I'm, I'm dating myself, but when I was a younger man, we, we did use it occasionally most, most of the time to comment on either a trick on a skateboard or the catching of a wave or uh, a jump on a BMX bike. Dude, that's totally righteous, right? It, it, was, it was the idea that, that that trick or that stunt was executed perfectly. But, but we, we don't really use that anymore. But, but we still use the word right. We tell people the right way to go in order to get to our house. We, we also use it, and, and perhaps this is, this is more helpful, 
we, we, we use it when, um, when somebody expresses that they're, they're in a state of bliss, that all is right with the world. And, and we even use it in relationships. F for example, if, um, if Jerry and I get in a little squabble and uh, we patch things up, I, I might say to Jerry, are we all right? Because I want to make sure the relationship between the two of us is good. Jerry's not a big squabbler. I just picked on him since he's in the front row. But, but this is an important concept because, because one of the, the things that the Bible informs us of, especially here in the book of Romans, is that humanity's big problem is things aren't all right between us and God naturally. Things aren't right between us and him, and, and something needs to take place in order to, to heal that relationship and make that right. And, and that's part of what Paul's getting at here in verse 17. Now, normally when we talk about the righteousness of God, we're, we're talking about how God is perfect in all of his ways, how he's perfect in his judgment, how he always does what is good. God doesn't ever need to think, I'm sorry, God doesn't ever need to fix anything about himself. There are times when I get ready for, for church on Sunday morning, I'll look to my wife and say, hey, do I look all right? And she'll come and adjust my collar or fix whatever's wrong with me. God doesn't have anything on him that needs to be fixed. There's not anything in his character that needs to be fixed. He's perfectly holy and just, and we are not. But Paul here isn't talking about the righteousness of God as it relates to God's perfections. He's talking here about something different. He's talking about the righteousness from God. Look in verse 17. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith. So, Here's, here, here's our problem. Here's our dilemma, right? Uh, our, our problem and our dilemma is that God is perfectly righteous in all of his ways. We are unrighteous. So, so, so the problem is how, how do we get right with God? How, how are things made right between the creature and the creator? We, we can't do it ourselves. We, we, we we can't work hard enough. We can't reinvent ourselves enough. We, we can't um, add enough steps into our, our, our life to improve ourselves to make us righteous because God is so holy and we are not. And so God says, I'm going to make and declare you righteous. I'm going to make you righteous in my sight. We're going to see more about this in chapter 3 and 4 of Romans. But I'm going to reckon righteousness to you through my son, Jesus Christ. And so Paul is here talking about a righteousness that comes from him. Theologians call this an imputed righteousness or an alien righteousness. You know, we talk about aliens, they come from another world. This righteousness comes from outside of us. It's, it's an otherworldly righteousness, if you would. It's a, it's a right standing that is received from God, offered to us by His Son, Tim Keller calls it. So we are made right with God by faith, by trusting Him, by relying on Him, by banking on Him. You, you want to be made right with God? Trust Him. Trust in His Son. Trust in what He has done for you in the person of His Son. Look at verse 17 again. For the, in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So again, we are called not just to place our faith in Christ once. We are called to live by faith. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved 
if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Friends, we, we are to continue believing. We are to continue persevering. I, I, I can't sing like the guy from Journey, but don't stop believing, right? Keep believing. Keep trusting. Keep relying. Keep depending on God. Look, we're to trust Him not just with our eternity, but we're to trust Him with our lives now. We're to trust Him with our finances and our affections and our plans and our families and our jobs and our homes and our life and our death and our sexuality and our marriage. This, this is what living a life of faith is. It's a, it's a life of constantly depending on God and trusting in God. God has already declared that things are right between us and him because of Christ. And if God's taking care of that, if he's taking care of your eternity, why is it you can't trust him with your tomorrow? We are to live by faith. We are to be constantly looking to Christ and trusting in Christ. The Bible says, without faith, in Hebrews, it's impossible to please God. So so if there's no area in your life in which you are trusting in God, I take that verse to understand that that you're not living a life that's pleasing to Him. If, If your entire life is organized and set up according to your plans and your ideas and how you're going to shape the universe and you're not looking to God in faith for any of that, I don't think you're living a life pleasing to him. We are to constantly live by faith. Isn't sin at its root a lack of faith? Failing to trust in God's goodness or his promises or or, or taking things that aren't yet yours sooner rather than later? Trusting is failing to trust his timing? We, people of God, are called to live by faith day after day after day. So the idea of, well, I'll I'll put in my time on Sunday morning and that's where my faith goes down and and I take care of my faith for the week, kind of like my gym workout. No, we are to live present active indicative for you Greek geeks. Okay, It's, it's a constant putting your faith in Christ. Some of you are saying, but Pastor Robert, that's, that's, that's scary. There's, there's a lot of things in my life that I'm, I'm I like being in control. I, I, I control. I like knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. I, I, I like having my plans and my checklists and checking everything off and, and trusting you more that uh, scary. And I don't know if I have enough faith for that, you might say. What, what I think, I think Paul addresses that concern where he says this righteousness is by faith from first to last. What, what, is, what is he saying when he says this righteousness is by faith from first to last? I, I, I think he's, he's re-emphasizing this idea later on where he says the righteous will live by faith. That, that, that faith is something we ongoingly trust in and and I, I, think, I think what might be helpful is to remember what Jesus said about faith. He said, you need the faith of a mustard seed. That's what you need. Uh, yesterday, no, a couple days ago, Paul and I, Paul, Bonnie, and I were up here walking around the grounds because we're having a work day this Saturday. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. And one of the things we saw, one, one of the things we need a lot of work help with is, is weeds and landscaping. And I, I saw the slope right around there, and I started to see mustard. There's about 20 mustard stalks on that slope up there. They're, 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 they're tiny. They're only a foot foot and a half tall, very unassuming. You leave that mustard there for a month or two, and the whole hillside's going to be yellow. So too, friends, with, with your faith, one of the things you discover is that as you 
begin to trust in Christ as you place more of your life and, and entrust more of your life to his care ongoingly over and over and over again, you start seeing his faithfulness and you start seeing how, reli- how, how dependable he is and you're willing to place more and more and more faith in him and your faith will grow and you start living that way where you pray each day, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Instead of my kingdom come, my will be done. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Lord, we, um, we want things to be right between you and us. And Lord, I know that things are right between you and me. I know things are right between you and me because of what you say in your word and have declared to me in your word. And and I know things are right between you and me because of what your son has done for me. And I pray that's true for everyone here. Lord, we, we want to be a righteous people who live by faith. Because your word tells us that's that's evidence. Our our living by faith is evidence that things are right between you and us. So Lord, uh, would you banish sin from our hearts and minds? When when sin does rear its ugly head, would you help us to fight it? Fight that sin. Fight those fears. Fight those worries with faith in you. Because you're a good and gracious and merciful God. Help us to constantly and continually look to you and to continue to trust you, not just with our eternity, but, but with the now aspect of our salvation, the everydayness of it. May we be a people who, it will be evident, are wholly dependent on you. We pray in Christ's precious name.